Okay, so I've just watched Batman vs Superman for the second time, and uh, I I loved it just as much as I did the first time. Actually, I think I love it more after watching it the second time because sort of knowing what to expect, what's going to happen, and also knowing where you should actually pay attention to the storyline actually aids in appreciating the movie even more. You know, and uh, well, I suppose I'm gonna talk about spoilers. Yeah, and I'm also gonna. Actually, defend the movie. Not that I think it needs defending, but I think some things need to be cleared up about it first and foremost, right? The one of the biggest criticisms that was leveled at the movie was that it's it hates Superman. I I have heard this countless times, um, you know, when I came out from the cinema earlier, and I've heard it, you know, or should I say, I've read it on the internet, whereby people make the contention that Zack Snyder is not a Superman fan. And I, I, I disagree with that because ultimately when you go through the movie and you see all of these people that are hating on Superman, you know, uh, Perry White uh, is uh, one of them, right? In the sense that, actually, no, not Perry White, I'm sorry. Um, what do you call it? The, the senator, what's her name? June Finch, right? Seems to be hating on Superman. Lex Luthor hates on Superman. Uh, Batman hates on Superman. Everybody seems to hate on Superman. And... And you, you, you think, okay, if you were to look at it from a simplistic prism, it'd be like, yes, the movie hates Superman. But no, the, the, the whole point of the movie is showing you that these people are wrong to hate Superman. Because ultimately, in spite of everything, in spite of everything that happens to him and what he does, uh, what, what is done to him, he still ultimately does the right thing. He still chooses humanity. He still chooses to do good. You know, and that's not necessarily the easiest thing to do. It'd be so easy to just, well, kill everyone, right? And uh, it'd be so easy to just eliminate people that don't agree with him, which is what happens in 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 Crisis on Two Earths, where um, Superman is actually called uh, was it Ultra Ultraman or something like that? Yeah, uh, and and is part of the uh, this sort of a bizarre Justice League where he's evil. And also in the Injustice universe where Superman, due to um, the death of Lois Lane caused by the Joker, just decides to enslave the entire human race anyway, right? And gets and splits the Justice League in two, you know? But then we see throughout this movie that Superman ultimately chooses to do the right thing to, to re- remain, what's the word I'm looking for? Loyal to his humanity by always trying to do the right thing. And speaking of killing, here's another uh, criticism, of course, that, I've, that I keep on hearing about Batman breaking his one rule, where he kills people. Now, it's funny that people take issue with Batman killing in this movie, because Batman has killed in all of his movies, right? Uh, in The Dark Knight, he kills Harvey Dent, you know? Um, and, of course, uh, you know, in Batman and Batman Returns, he kills people. I think the only movie whereby he doesn't actively participate or indirectly participate in someone's death is of course Batman and Robin right and the less we talk about that movie the better (laughs) you know but it's not like Batman has not killed before and let me justify why Batman kills in this movie because as he says to Alfred you know 20 years in Gotham Alfred you know how many good guys are left how many stayed that way you know and what he says just a little bit before that we've always been criminals right and it's just a Batman who just really does not give a shit anymore, right? You know, there's the, the sense of morality and everything. You know, the, the sense of, um, you know, doing the right thing for him has deserted him. He sees himself as a criminal, you know. And that is a very important element of character development. B- Bruce Wayne's arc in uh, Dawn of Justice is very, very important and very critical towards the forming of the Justice League. Why? Because, well... Going on from his skewed sense of morality, right? And then encountering a being uh, that seems to be the manifestation of the hopelessness that he feels uh, uh, throughout his career as a crime fighter. As he says to Alfred, you know, weeds, uh, criminals are like weeds. Once you pull one, another one will come up. And he sees Superman as a form of his redemption, as a form of him leaving a legacy that will last. Because to him, fighting crime in Gotham all those years has been has been an exercise in futility, right? And Superman is the manifestation of that futility. And rightly or wrongly, he conflates the idea of doing something about Superman as actually making a difference 
you know and that's again a very very important aspect of his character because that then informs the next bit that we'll talk about and that people complain about which is suddenly he becomes superman's best friend after hearing that they have the common uh, a common uh, link i.e. the mother's name martha right now as a comic book fan i will freely admit that i'm ashamed that i never made this connection sooner that Martha Kent and Martha Wayne have the same name, you know, and I'm not the only one. I know there are a few out there who did not grasp uh, this commonality between two of the world's greatest superheroes. But at the same time, in the same way that soldiers that suffer from PTSD can just have triggers that set off all sorts of things, uh, you know, um, you know, in their heads just by hearing a sound or or hearing uh, or, or 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 seeing something. In that very same manner, when something happens to Bruce Wayne, in this well, when he's Batman and he hears Martha's name, all sorts of things happen to him. And the editing and the symbolism in this scene cannot be un- overstated, you know. And in fact, it is understated because a lot of people missed it. You know, the 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 rewinding back to that moment in his childhood where. Uh, you know, where his parents died, right? And then looking at, and the gun being that symbol, you know, of that evil that he tried so hard to get rid of and then not realizing then at that moment in time, until that moment in time, that he had become that gun. He had become nothing better than a crook on the street murdering people, you know? And all of these realizations, realizations crash in on him all at once. And that's when he figures out that Hang on a minute, you know, there, there, there's a better way of doing this, you know, and who better to show him than somebody who, is, in spite of everything that has happened to him, in spite of everything that Batman has done to him, that Lex Luthor has done to him, that the world has done to him, he is still choosing to do the right thing. He chooses not to kill Batman. And when he, we all know he could, he really, really could. All he kept on trying to do was trying to subdue Batman in order to talk to him, in order to save uh, his mother, right? And of course, the trigger, hearing the name and all that, reminds Batman then that actually he's dealing with an actual person. All the things that Batman says in the fight are attempts to dehumanize Superman. No, you are not a man. Men are brave. You know, you're not even a real man. He says stuff like this over and over again, not so much because he actually believes it, but also because through the rage and through the anger that he is trying to convince himself that he is doing something that will be worthwhile and doing something that is the right thing, right? And of course, we see the, the folly in that, you know? Which leads me, of course, on to another discussion about the fact that Batman's motivations are not made very clear. To some people, they're not very clear. To me, it was clear as day. You know, the, you know, with... First of all, Superman, you know, and Zod, de- you know, destroying Wayne Financial Tower and just splitting it in half, right? That's the first bit, you know? That's already a source of deep um, anger for Batman. And then when you think about also the manipulation that Lex Luthor was doing by intercepting those checks and 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 making it seem like Wallace Keefe, right? Who is also a key plot point here, who is a manifestation of the of Bruce Wayne's failures of taking care of people under under his uh, that are his responsibility. This is something this is the theme that is repeated that Batman in this movie has failed and failed constantly. You know, not only are we reminded by that when we look at Wallace, we are reminded by that about that when we look at Robin's costume, which as we have just uh, as Zack Schneider has just confirmed, uh, was indeed killed by the Joker about 10 years earlier. Right? This is not a spoiler, this is out on the internet, right? And of course, uh, you know, um, seeing his frame of mind, somebody who is just absolutely seething with rage and anger, how can he not then just concentrate all of that onto this seemingly perfect godlike being who seems to be the source of everything, you know? And there is a lot there when he says that, you know, we have a a thing in Gotham about dealing with freaks and, you know, that dress up like clowns, right? Uh, Because... In his warped mind, at that moment in time, his warped sense of reality, he somehow equates the Joker to Superman, right? Just another freak dressed up like a clown, you know? And just seeing all of the motivations laid out, there is perfect... Not to say perfect. I mean, to me, it was fine. Would I say it's perfect? Maybe perfect is too strong a word. But it is justified enough for me to see why that conflict happened, you know? And of course, we know that Superman went into the conflict simply because 
of Lex Luthor's manipulations, right? And let's discuss Lex Luthor here for a little bit because there are people saying that he's actually a manifestation of the Joker. Now, I have issues with that simply because there's more than one interpretation of the Joker. You know, if you're saying that the Lex Luthor here wants to be a Joker, he's he's somebody who sounds like he's got uh, ADHD. He's, he sounds like somebody who's got some form of, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, egomaniacal syndrome, right? And, and he doesn't look like he's having fun. That's the difference. That's the key difference here between Lex and the Joker, right? Lex's, you know, Lex's criminal element comes from a place of pain, comes from a place of, 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 of despair, not to say despair, of, of hatred and anger and all these extremely strong extremely negative emotions. I mean, he talks about the abuse from his father and all that. And it's, it's maniacal. It's unhinged. It's, 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 it's not to say it's crazy because it's very, very calculated. But at the same time, you know, uh, it is psychotic behavior, right? But at no point in time do you think that Lex Luthor is enjoying any of this. He's not. And that is the key point that separates, to me in my mind, the difference between Lex Luthor and the Joker. The Joker can do all sorts of screwed up shit, but he will laugh while he's doing it. He will actually enjoy it. He will actually immerse himself in it and and, and ride the roller coaster till the end of the road, wherever it takes him, whether it kills him or not. You know, and that is the key difference here. That's why, to me, you cannot say that Lex Luthor in this movie is just trying to be the Joker because he's not. And he's not trying to enjoy any of it at all, right? And of course, the you know, and then, of course, that goes into what we talk about, one of the main themes about this movie, which is power and people's obsession with power, right? Where Batman feels powerlessness and, of course, um, Lex Luthor feels powerlessness, right? And they both, again, look at Superman as the embodiment of power that they cannot have because Superman has power that, to them, can make an actual difference. That power that they themselves cannot wield and will never wield, you know? Uh, you know, again, going back to Bruce Wayne's helplessness, fighting crime constantly and never winning, and Lex Luthor, no matter what he tries to do to actually have real tangible power, being shut off, uh, you know, by people like politicians, like, you know, when uh, Senator Finch tells him, no, I'm, I'm vetoing, and what does Lex do? He ignores the power anyway. Key point there, key point there, you know, and, and of course, you know, the, and... One of his lines is very illuminating, you know, the biggest lie in America, um, uh, that power can be innocent, right? And of course, that to me is actually a very simplistic worldview because those that wield the power, you know, as, as they say, as the saying goes, people that crave power are the ones that are ill-equipped to actually have it and deal with it and to actually use it and administer it, you know? Uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely which is why superman is such a compelling hero because he has all this power and he's supposedly incorruptible right and that is the, the core of the character that might make him boring for some you know but to me it makes a fascinating character study that in spite which is you know which is played out throughout the movie in spite of all the crap that happens to him he still does the right thing he still tries to do the right thing which is the good thing you know and of course, when we talk about these themes of power and whatnot and helplessness and what it drives men to do, what it drives people to do when they're faced in this situation, you know, they say that in order to to see what people are capable of, put their backs against the wall and threaten them and then see what happens, you know. And when you put Lex Luthor's back to a wall and you put Batman's back to a wall, this is inevitably what happens. They will, you know, try and find their way out of it. And, and whereas when Superman has his back to the wall, whereas Batman and Lex turn to manipulation and, and dare I say it, um, negative uh, reactions, right? You contrast that with Superman, who, in spite of having his back to the wall, in spite of him being basically brought down to his knees by kryptonite, still chooses to do the right thing. And that is such an important part of the character. You cannot say that Zack Schneider hates Superman when he gives you every single reason possible to see that in spite of all of the tragedy that Superman suffers or, you know, the tragic things that happen to him, he still chooses the light side, the good side, you know? And that to me is, 
the, the core element of it. There's so much smart dialogue in this movie that is actually lost, uh, you know, amongst everything. And I've found a lot of people who are complaining about too much dialogue and not enough action. And there are people who are complaining that it's too much action and not enough dialogue. Which to me just says that people, uh, you know, just people have preferences and that's it, you know? And um, one of the pieces of dialogue that I found very illuminating when was when Lex was dis- discussing the concept of God. Right where he says that I learned from a very young age that God uh, cannot be all good or all powerful because if He is all good, He is not all powerful. If He is all powerful, then He is not all good. You know, which of course you know is is actually a discussion about uh, faith and and religion, right? And uh, you know, talks about uh, themes of um, you know uh, you know atheism so to speak, right? I mean, how can you actually believe uh, that a God is all-powerful and yet still be a just God if in the world that you grow up in, evil actually happens? Because if the God is all-powerful, he has the power to stop the evil. But if he does not stop the evil, then he is complicit in it. And if he is complicit in it, then he is not just. And that is the whole thing that, that the point that Lex Luthor is trying to make. You know, he's trying to paint Superman as not a god. The, th- the funny thing is that Superman does not pretend to be a god. He might be godlike with his powers, right? But he can even he can only be in one place at one time at any given moment, you know? Which is, of course, you know, we can put it down to Lex and his psychosis and having a warped sense of reality, right? And, uh, well, what else can we talk about in the movie? Gosh, um... Oh, there's another plot hole that people claim about Lois Lane throwing away the spear and then getting it again. I would like to think that Lois Lane is smart enough to realize that since um, Doomsday, when he appears, actually comes from the Kryptonian ship, means then that Doomsday is Kryptonian in nature. So therefore, when she sees that uh, Doomsday cannot be defeated by Superman and, and, and Wonder Woman and Batman, that the Kryptonian spear is indeed needed. So she puts two and two together and tries to get it. I To me, it's like, okay, she's smart enough to be, able to, to be able to figure that out on her own, right? And to me, it's not really a plot point, even though there's no communication between the Trinity. Oh, what a beautiful sight to see them on screen. The Trinity and Lois Lane when they fight Doomsday, right? And of course, um, going back again to the Trinity, of course, uh, Ga- uh, Gal Gadot, Wonder Woman, absolute showstopper, love her theme song and everything. And of course, you know, it was great to see the appearance of her classic weapons, the shield, the sword, and the lasso of truth, right? Batman zipping around on his zip lines, you know, and of course, Superman being Superman, which brings us back to the finale, right, of Doomsday. Now, there are some people, my brother included, who have issues with Doomsday um, being of Kryptonian origin, right, instead of being from space. Now, the thing is that, to me, again, that's not really an issue. I don't, I don't see a problem with changing the origin because, again, this is a new Superman for a new age. This is a new mythology that we're living with, right? And it's not like comic books haven't been rebooted before, people. Hmm? Yeah? You know? And did you, did you recall that time when Batman would kill mobsters by throwing, by knocking them unconscious or, you know, and then crushing their cars in garbage compactors? Yeah, yeah. Did you know that Superman in his first few uh, issues would actually just randomly toss around cars on the street in order to stop robbers from running away. Yeah, he would indulge in public property destruction, you know? My point being that there are different interpretations of the characters and they are allowed to coexist. There's no right version of these characters, you know? There's just a version that one guy makes, Zack Schneider, Chris Terrio, and David S. Goyer for this one in Batman, uh, Superman, Dawn of Justice. There's another one that someone else wrote, like Mark Wade in Superman Birthright. And of course, there's a there's a version that Jerry Schuster and uh, Joe Siegel, I think, you know, that first wrote for Superman in 1939 when he first 1938 when he first came about. So there are constant, you know, new versions of all of these characters coming out. So you cannot just say that one doesn't work with another. You know, do they have broadly similar characteristics that have defined us throughout the ages? Maybe, maybe not. You know, but at the same time, why? Can't we just have another interpretation of it? To me, I'm fine with Zack Schneider, Chris Terrio, and David S. Goyer's interpretation of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. I, I, I freely admit to loving it. 
you know? So we can't get on a high horses and say that, oh, okay, your version is wrong, your version is wrong, or your version is wrong, and my version is right. We can't do that with these characters simply because there have been so many versions of them. You know, who is the true Batman? Is it the Frank Miller version? Is it the Scott Schneider version? Right? Is it the Zack Schneider version? Version? We don't know. Who's the real Superman? Is it Christopher Reeves? Uh, the version? Is it uh, you know? Is it uh, Dean Cain's version? Is it Brendan Routh's version? You know? Or, gosh, is it George Reeves' version? There's so many different versions of Superman, right? And we can't really say which one is right and which one is wrong, you know. You know, I mean, sorry to break it to you kids, but like Superman has killed before, you know, um, and of course Batman has killed before. And we all know that Wonder Woman is also a killer, but we don't need to discuss her because Wonder Woman, funnily enough, is the only character in this movie that has had no controversy attached to her as a result of the movie. Her casting before the movie, on the other hand, was a shitstorm of criticism accusing the movie producers and, and the director of not knowing, of not <laughs> knowing what, what who Wonder Woman actually is. And then next thing you know, she absolutely kills it the entire movie, which is fantastic, right? Oh gosh, this video is going on for a long time. Okay, so let's also discuss the, the future direction of the DC Extended Universe. Now, first of all, we need to talk about the nightmares, right? And the appearance of what appears to be the Flash. To me, it is the Flash first and foremost, because it seems to me like he's reaching back through the Speed Force right? To try and warn Bruce. Now, the thing is that we don't exactly know how the Speed Force works in this particular universe, right? Maybe he can only travel back in time through subconscious, uh, you know, subconscious realms in order to warn people and to change time and whatever, all that stuff, you know? Or maybe, um, you know, he didn't have enough power, uh, you know, and the speed, sport, speed Force because another speedster was sharing, was uh, inhibiting the Speed Force at the exact same time, preventing him from fully time traveling back to actually meet Bruce Wayne, okay? And of course, the lines there are very illuminating. Find us, Bruce, you know? He's the key, you're right to fear him. Lois Lane, hey, no, Lois Lane is the key, you're right to fear him, you're right all along. And then, of course, that is after he has the nightmare, uh, you know, where we see the Omega symbol in the sand, which now I've just found out is actually the dried out ocean bed between Metropolis and Gotham. Right, and then there you see the Omega symbol, which is Darkseid's symbol, and of course we have the Parademons, which herald the coming of Darkseid. Now, to me, the threat isn't is is twofold. It's not just about Darkseid coming, which is what Lex Luthor alludes to, right? Uh, after he activated Doomsday, right? Um, uh, whereby you know he basically you know injects his own DNA. Uh, mixes it with Kryptonian DNA and then tries to reanimate Zod's corpse in order to create Doomsday, right? Um, it's not just that. It's not just Doomsday. Uh, it's not just Dark Side that's coming. It's also the fact that there is prior um, prior experience in the comic books, of course. That uh, well, hmm. Let me get back to that and think. Let me think about that and get back to you. Right. So where was I? Yeah, the nightmare. Okay, so regarding the nightmare, um, you know, it foretells two things. The coming of Darkseid is one of them. The other is, of course, Darkseid's manipulation of Superman, right? And uh, mind controlling him, which, of course, has happened before in the comics. It's happened also in the animated movies, right? And this, I think, uh, is part of it, right? Um... But it might not be as simple as that. It might not just be mind control. It might also be manipulation of events. Because in the Injustice storyline, we see that Superman finally, you know, turns into a bad guy because of the death of Lois Lane, right? And because of how the Joker manipulated Superman uh, using, I think it's a Scarecrow's uh, fear toxin or something along those lines to convince Superman that he was actually... Uh, Oh, no, 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 it was, um, it was uh, the bomb blowing up in Metropolis, killing Lois and their unborn child, resulting in Superman going crazy and then eventually killing the Joker and then enslaving the rest of the human race and forcing all of the Justice League, except for Batman, uh, to align with him, right? And of course, Batman is the one that stands against him, you know? I, I keep on coming back to Batman simply because of the fact that a lot of people are very, 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 uh, unhappy, I suppose, with, you know, him breaking his one rule, right? And, um, 
I actually see it as not really an issue, right? There have been arguments around the internet about what constitutes the real Batman or the right Batman, and well, there just isn't any, which goes back to the earlier point that there can be different interpretations of characters. Either you like them or you don't like them, right? They are those characters no matter what, right? Because it's not just the creators, but the creative people that, you know, re- rebirth them, uh, that, that, that reshape them into any way, shape or form that they desire. And it's up to us to decide as the audience whether or not we actually like these versions of the characters. You know, and of course, regarding the whole killing thing, Batman has killed in every single live action movie. Let me just repeat that. Every single live action movie that he has been in, he has killed. Directly, indirectly, he has killed people, right? Except, of course, for Batman and Robin. Of course. So, that means then we're setting up for Justice League Part 1. Um, it's going to be one, uh, you know, uh, presumably it's going to be the six of them, right? We have the Flash, which makes his cameo. Right, uh, in John of Justice, we have Aquaman who has made his cameo, Wonder Woman who has made more than just a cameo, Batman, and of course Cyborg. Right, and of course the interesting thing about Cyborg's transformation into Cyborg from Victor Stone to Cyborg was of course the existence of the Mother Box, which is a piece of Dark Side tech, right, New God tech, right, um, which allows him to manipulate his shape so that he can you know create projectile uh, projectile or energy weapons, right. And, of course, that's another nod to the fact that Darkseid exists and is coming, right? And, um, yeah, of course, the big question is, where's the Green Lantern? Um, To me, if I was to speculate, I would like to think then that because of the events of Justice League Part 1, the Green Lantern Corps realizes that something is afoot in this sector of the galaxy and that they don't have a Green Lantern here simply because, well... Earth was probably so unremarkable and so boring and nothing really happened there except for people killing each other, which happens all the time, right? And there was no galaxy-wide threat happening that they didn't feel the need to appoint a Green Lantern for that particular sector. And of course, the events of Justice League Part 1 show that no, Darkseid himself has turned his attention towards Earth and therefore the Green Lantern Corps needs to be called into action. And I think, yeah. I think that's, I think that I see I I see that as the way that it plays out. Will we see Hal Jordan or John Stewart? Doesn't matter, you know. Um, I like both versions of the characters, so not really an issue for me as well. But yeah, uh, that's how it is. Can't wait for Wonder Woman solo movie, of course, next year, and can't wait as well for Justice League Part One. So yeah, so if you have any disagreements that you would like to address regarding all of my speculations and thoughts in this spoiler-filled video of Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, leave them in the comments below, PM me, you know, send me an email, I don't know anything, right? And of course, um, some of the material that I've discussed today was actually uh, written about by a Forbes.com writer, I'll put the link in the description below, and uh, you guys can check it out there. Um... The writer actually mirrors a lot of my thoughts regarding uh, Batman v Superman and how this movie is actually indeed a, a an affirmation of the Superman that we all know and love. You know, just because he's been put in darker sub- circumstances, he's been put through uh, emotional hell, he's been put through the ringer, and he shows anger and he shows uh, sadness and all of these emotions does not then necessarily mean that this is a bad, to me, not a bad interpretation of Superman at all. Actually, I quite love it. So yeah, guys, peace out. That's all.